Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Madeline Jarrett, and I'm the Graduate Research Assistant for the Boise Center for Religion and American Public Life at Boston College. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our 21st Annual Prophetic Voices Lecture, entitled Prophetically Provocative, Jesus as Mime, Mirror, and Muse. Before the main event, I'd like to offer two housekeeping items. First, this conversation will be recorded and will be made available on our website after the event. So in light of this, please silence your cell phones. Secondly, we'd like to draw your attention to two exciting upcoming events this semester. A week from today on Wednesday, April 10th, we will be welcoming Father James Martin for a book signing and lecture entitled, What Happened at the Synod? His lecture will take place from 5.30 to 7 p.m. in McGuinn Hall, room 121 here at Boston College. And on April 17th, we will welcome Professor Matthew Vail for a luncheon colloquium entitled Buddhist Practices for Widening the Eye, Taking Other Beings as One's Body. The luncheon will take place from 12 to 1 p.m. at 24 Quincy Road, and again, that's on April 17th. To learn more about these and our other events, please visit our website, bc.edu slash boise, B-O-I-S-I. And if you prefer to get your information in more trendy ways, we encourage you to follow, uh, follow us on social media. And now I will turn over the podium to the director of the Boise Center, Mark Massa. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It's great to see you on such a cold and dreary day. Uh, as I said to Nancy, this is the largest gathering of congregationalists in this part of Newton since <laughs> the Reverend John Elliott founded the West Church about a mile. <laughs> The Reverend Nancy Taylor is Senior Minister Emeritus of Old South Church in Boston, where I went to hear her many times preach, uh, where she served as Senior Minister and CEO from 2005 until her retirement in 2022. She was, of course, ordained in the United Church of Christ and served churches large and small, rural and urban, across more than 40 years. She holds degree, degrees from the Yale Divinity School and from Chicago Theological Seminaries. She has a long list of honors and awards, which I will not go through, but she received Yale Divinity School's distinction in the Congregational Ministry Award. She received the Hewlett Packard Award for Human Rights, the Rabbi Murray Rothman Award for Fostering Interreligious Understanding, and she serves on Yale Divinity School's Advisory Council and is co-chair of its capital campaign. And she is also on the advisory boards of the Miller Center for Interreligious Leadership in Hebrew College. And I'm proud to say she serves on my own board of visitors here at Boston College. So please join with me in welcoming a woman that you and I both admire and look forward to listening to, Nancy Taylor. Warmest thanks to Mark Massa, who invited me here today, and despite having done so, he should not be held responsible for whatever is to come. <laughs> <laughs> to set the context, I am not a scholar, just a pastor. For over 40 years, as Mark said, I pastored churches. I served uh, in rural Maine, Hartford, Connecticut, Boise, Idaho, Boston, Massachusetts. I had the best job in the world. People paid me to hang out with God. Imagine that. I would describe myself as something of an activist pastor. As a pastor, I was responsible for the spiritual welfare of my flock, leading worship, Christian formation, administering the sacraments, presiding at funerals and weddings, serving as head of staff, and managing fundraising, buildings, and budgets. But I also ventured out from the church and into the world. While serving in rural Maine, I founded a food pantry. In Boise, Idaho, I helped to defeat two anti-gay ballot initiatives and to pass legislation securing a minimum wage for Idaho farm workers. I also co-founded a human rights memorial park and education center. And in Massachusetts, I helped to author and amend this state's mandated reporting statute to include clergy as mandated reporters of suspected child abuse. I later worked to make equal marriage the law of the land in Massachusetts. 
As an activist pastor, I hoped to engage the world, challenge the world, sometimes even change the world, on behalf of a gracious and merciful God. In my view, the world is rather short on mercy. Jesus, in my view, is very long on mercy. Mercy matters. Mercy is prophetic. I also ventured out from the church and into the world because, as I see it, Jesus was an activist pastor. He could have, but he did not set up shop in a synagogue. He ventured out into the world of human need. If the Boise Center is interested in religion in American public life, Jesus, I would argue, was interested in religion in Palestinian public life. Everything about his ministry was public, most of it occurring out of doors in public view. As it happened, the public was quite interested in Jesus. He was interesting and compelling. He was alluring. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you who are as far from us as the most distant star, and as near to each of us as our own breathing, come near now, bend low, enter this hall. Come so near to each of us as to oil the hinges of our heart's doors, that they may swing easily and gently to welcome your coming. Amen. It occurs to me that I have a um, an outline. Maddie, would you happily an outline to pass out so you can follow along? <clears throat> and the good news is um, we've done the prelude and the prayer. <laughs> we are on to part one: Jesus as mine. In your imagination, travel back with me to a time before layers of ecclesiastical sediment had piled up so thickly that it has become hard to find Jesus beneath the deposits of centuries of councils and creeds, of synods and sacraments, of encyclicals and ecclesiologies. Travel back to a time before there was a doctrine of the Trinity or theories of the atonement, before there were Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant. Travel back, way back, before Constantine or St. Columba, before Opus Dei or the Salvation Army, before El Greco's resurrection or Newton's amazing grace, before Jesus Christ Superstar or Billy Graham, before Desmond Tutu or Dr. King, before Christianity. I invite you to travel back to the first century to ancient Rome to the home of Mark, the Mark we would come to know as Mark the Evangelist. Mark sits before a blank parchment, his hand poised, preparing to write his story of Jesus. But where to begin? When Mark's hand finally does touch the parchment, his story of Jesus begins in the middle. In Mark's story of Jesus in his gospel, there is no prologue. In Mark's telling of it, there are neither stars nor magi. There is no virgin, no babe leaping in the womb. No angels visiting, no shepherds abiding, no crowded in. Mark does offer a bit of critical framing, however. Mark needs us to know this, that the Christ he is about to introduce has been foretold by the magnificent prophet Isaiah. Firmly and boldly, Mark locates Jesus in the ancient line of the biblical prophets. Jesus is prophetic. He is prophetic in the way of the classical Hebrew prophets, that is, he too will summon his hearers to wed worship of God with ethical conduct. Or put differently, he will summon us to enact a union and integration of the first and second commandments. Or put differently yet again, in this strain of biblical prophecy, it is not possible to be righteous without doing justice. Having established Jesus' prophetic credentials, Mark's Jesus arrives on the scene fully grown. Wordlessly, Jesus walks onto the stage into an out-of-doors public setting. Wordlessly, surrounded by onlookers, Jesus wades into the waters of the Jordan River. Wordlessly, he submits to John's baptism. Still without saying a word and dripping wet now, his clothing sodden, Jesus arises from his baptism and is driven into the wilderness. 
There for 40 days and 40 nights he fasts and is tempted. Still, he says nothing. A little later, after his ordeal, Jesus enters a synagogue. He begins to teach. We are told, Mark assures us, he reports us to us that those who hear him are astonished at his teaching. How curious then that Mark, Jesus' first biographer, records nothing of what Jesus says. Mark records not a single word of this inaugural and astonishing sermon. The same is true in the synagogue of Nazareth. Mark reports that in Jesus' hometown synagogue, those who hear him teach are astounded, remarking, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? But yet again, Mark fails to relate the content of this remarkable, wisdom-filled teaching. The Gospel according to Mark is generally recognized as the first and the oldest of the stories of Jesus. It is also the briefest and the most cryptic. In fact, throughout Mark's entire account of Jesus, there are precious few words ascribed to him. In this oldest of the Gospels, Jesus preaches no Sermon on the Mount. There are no Beatitudes, no Lord's Prayer. Among the Synoptic Gospels, Luke records 24 parables, while Matthew relates 23. By contrast, Mark recounts just eight parables of Jesus. Mark does recount the transfiguration. He paints a vivid image of a dazzling Jesus, a Jesus, moreover, who is conversing in real time with Moses and Elijah. And yet, once again, we have no record, not a single word of that extraordinary conversation. I'm suggesting that in an attempt to be faithful to the Jesus that Mark presents, it is necessary to experience Jesus, to see Jesus with our eyes as a kind of mind. Mark wants us to watch Jesus carefully, to follow his movements as carefully as one follows the movements of a mime. Mime is theatrical and visual. The mime employs stylized motions to help make the invisible visible. Jesus, the person of Jesus, the physical fact of him, is God made visible. The actions of an excellent mime are universally understood. Language is no barrier. Jesus is an excellent mime. Moreover, the miming actions of Jesus are intentionally suggestive as opposed to prescriptive. They are presented as provocative, invitational, parabolic, and interactive, requiring the engagement of our moral imaginations. As if in a silent film, Jesus lifts bread and breaks it. He blesses it. He lays hands upon the sick to heal them. He exercises demons. He stills the storm. Radiating anger, he overturns tables in the temple. He departs familiar jurisdictions and enters into unfamiliar, vaguely threatening territories. To the consternation of his followers, he deigns to bless children. He motions a tax collector from his tax collecting booth and pulls him into discipleship. He dines with sinners, visiting with them in their homes. Enacting a little street theater, he stages his entry into Jerusalem. He gives no speech there. He simply enters the city provocatively, evocatively, astride a cult. His actions speak volumes. Later, toward the end, when Jesus is under arrest and being questioned by the authorities, silence. Still later, when the crucified Jesus is hanging on the cross and cruelly being taunted by Roman soldiers, silence. The silences of Jesus are at once provocative and invitational. In the vein of the prophets, Jesus goads his audiences, intending thereby to shift our perception, open wide our two closed hearts, and shed scales from our unseeing eyes. If we assume the shorter ending of Mark, Mark ends his gospel, his story of Jesus, with yet more silence, with the haunting, disquieting, hollow silence of an empty tomb and a missing body. Mark wants us to know that with Jesus, it is not so much what he says as what he does. It is important to watch where he goes and to note with whom it is that he interacts. To understand him, to get near him, it is necessary first to follow him with our eyes, but then and indispensably, 
It is also to follow where he goes, to follow Jesus with our lives, to follow with our own warm human bodies. And I don't know about you, but for me, well, I do know about you, because I know a whole lot of you that are here. <laughs> um, I, I know that for me, the attempt to follow Jesus with my body, however haltingly I have done so, is an undertaking and a revelation, usually inconvenient, sometimes chancy. I am sure you have your stories. Following Jesus has taken me behind prison bars and into jails. It has taken me into courtrooms, hospital rooms, and nursing homes, to the bedsides of the dying and to the birthing room. It has carried me to Senate chambers and governor's offices, to refugee and immigration centers, to South Africa's Robben Island, and with Reverend June Cooper, to Boston's tent city at Mass and Cass. It has taken me to streets and marches and rallies and vigils and protests. It has taken me to countless meetings for as the great Jewish theologian Martin Buber observed, all real living is meeting. Mark's Jesus is a meter. He meets people. He goes out of his way to meet people, to meet them where they are. Moreover, Mark writes about a Jesus who is in constant motion. He is here then there. Jesus moves from river to desert to mountain, from village to seashore to boat, from hillside to synagogue. If, in the words of the journalist Hunter Thompson, half of life is just showing up, well, Jesus shows up. He is no stay-at-home, keep-the-synagogue-warm sort of figure. Jesus shows up. Read Mark's Gospel and watch. Watch what Jesus does with his body and other people's bodies. Keep an eye out for those to whom he speaks, those whom he touches, even more than for what he says. For while Jesus speaks to many, Mark records very few of Jesus' words. I am therefore forced to assume, to conjecture, that in Mark's view, a large part of the teaching Jesus does has nothing to do with words. Rather, Jesus teaches by his movements and his motions, by his whereabouts, and his encounters, by the healing and feeding and blessings he bestows so freely. Jesus teaches by the conversations he strikes up with the strangers he encounters more than by the content of those conversations. Very few, we have very few content, content in that. And this raises a question for Christians and today's churches. As followers of Jesus, what do people see when they are watching you and your church? What can they learn from you about Jesus by observing how you move, with whom you speak, the places you go? Do others see you or your church? Does the public see you in the acts of blessing, hosting, healing, touching, feeding, forgiving, crossing boundaries, breaking bread with sinners? And I wonder this, in seeing you, in observing you in your church, are they astonished? Are they ever astonished, sometimes astonished, in a good way, by what they see? Miming Jesus, a practical application. Some years ago at Old South Church in Boston, this is after the closing of the bridge to Long Island, we noticed that more and more unhoused neighbors were joining us for Sunday worship. They were the first to arrive, waiting outside, the minute we opened the doors, they were the first in. Now, we were used to hosting coffee hours after worship, a somewhat anemic offering of coffee and cookies. But the growing presence of unhoused neighbors who arrived on our doors hungry, unbreakfasted, prompted us to shift things around a bit. So we made more coffee, great urns of piping hot coffee, and these were out the minute the door was open. And along with the coffee, we took to serving bananas and boxes of raisins, soft granola bars, cheese and crackers, food substantial enough to fill hungry bellies, yet soft enough for those with poor teeth. There was no fanfare to this, no announcement, no teaching. It was a silent undertaking, a gesture inspired by Jesus. Over time, this attention to hospitality visibly altered the composition of our congregation. This evolving demographic shift became its own kind of parable. The presence of strangers with different ways changed and challenged us, provoked and goaded us 
into unfamiliar territory. Part two, Jesus as mirror. Mark also presents Jesus as a kind of mirror. As Jesus meanders throughout Palestine, healing and teaching and blessing and encountering, it's as if he holds up a mirror. Our eyes are trained on Jesus. However, looking at him becomes inescapably a parabolic undertaking. While we are looking at Jesus, we discover that we are seeing ourselves more clearly. For instance, when Jesus upsets the tables in the temple and drives out the money changers, we find ourselves looking at our own temples, our own churches and sanctuaries, and we cannot help but ask, how can we not ask whether our houses of prayer are what they ought to be? Whether the sacred spaces over which we preside, so hushed and orderly, are what God aches for them to be? When Jesus chastises the disciples for trying to keep children from bothering him, we are prompted to self-reflection, asking, when have I treated children as a bother? When Jesus sends out the twelve two by two with no provisions, we cannot help but wonder what it would feel like to be that exposed, that vulnerable, that trusting of God, that dependent upon the kindness of strangers. When Jesus announces that true greatness means the last shall be first and the first shall be last, we shrink in acknowledgement of our own acquiescence to the hierarchies of power and privilege that are our daily bread, both in the church and in the world. Mark shows us a Jesus is, who is so free, we cannot help but see our own limits. Mark portrays a Jesus who is so authentic, we cannot help but contrast Jesus' authenticity with our own poor imitations of our true selves. If words can be cheap, Mark portrays Jesus as rich in action, in the doing of the word. For his followers, Jesus is God's best word. Mark's Jesus is also demanding. He provides few answers, but he asks a lot of questions. When he heals the paralytic, he asks, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or rise, take up your mat and walk? And we cannot help but wonder which is easier. And we are forced to examine our churches asking, do people experience forgiveness here among us? Which is to ask, do they experience God's mercy here among us? And are they empowered here to take up their mats? Jesus turns to his disciples and demands, who do you say that I am? And we are forced to wrestle with that same question for ourselves. <clears throat> who is Jesus for you? Who is Jesus for me? Among, the, among all the people and entities vying for my attentions and my allegiance, where does Jesus fit? When his opponents press him about paying taxes, Jesus asks whose image is on the coin, and we find ourselves investigating our own allegiances to God and Caesar. We find ourselves interrogating our own conflicted lives and loyalties, do we not? Standing before a man with a withered hand in the synagogue on the Sabbath, Jesus asks, is it lawful to do good, to do good on the Sabbath, to heal? And we are again turned in on ourselves, wondering about our Sunday worship and asking ourselves just how much good we are doing. Jesus is healing a man born blind and he asks, what do you see? And the man says, I see people, but they look like trees walking. And we are reminded that we do not see others clearly, but incompletely. And like the blind man, we yearn to see what Jesus can show us. As a preacher, as one who is confronted by the questions Jesus asked, I am forced to wonder whether my own sermons delivered over 40 plus years asked enough questions. Were my sermons a la Jesus sufficiently invitational and probative, or were they, as I fear, too often declarative and proclamatory, aimed more at imparting wisdom or teaching rather than provoking and engaging the moral and spiritual imaginations of my hearers. In the presence of Jesus, we find ourselves looking critically at our own traditions and cultures, at the meaningfulness of our lives, at our assumptions, at what makes us afraid 
and what holds us back. Mark desperately wants his readers to see and experience what he has come to see and feel, that in the presence of Jesus, the life of faith is not a matter of teachings. Christianity is not a body of teaching so much as it is a way of living and moving in this world. In the presence of Jesus, the considerable attention we pay to church polities, to ecclesiastical structures and hierarchies, is made a mockery of. Instead, Jesus wants to know where we take our bodies, with whom we interact, how much meaningful good we do, how well we bless and forgive and feed. Mirroring Jesus, a practical application. Some years ago, shortly after the bombs exploded at the marathon finish line, Islam Islamophobia was really on the rise in Boston but across the land. Muslims felt threatened. In response, at Old South Church, we created a banner which riffed on the Great Commandment. Our version read, love your Muslim, in parentheses, neighbor as yourself. And we hung this large banner, eight feet by five feet, outside on our building in Copley Square for all to see. It garnered plenty of responses. Mm -hmm. And I'll give two examples of responses, one on either end of the spectrum. We received a message from an Iranian father whose son at the time was in college in Boston. This father was terrified for his Muslim son, who was so far away from home in a strange land, in a hostile land. The father worried for his son's safety. He worried for his life. As it happens, his son had walked past our church one day, saw the banner, took a picture, sent it to his father. His father looked us up, wrote to us, thanked us, telling us how much better it made both he and his son feel. It made them feel seen. It made them feel welcomed. It made them feel safer. On the other end of the spectrum of responses, a local woman, having caught sight of the banner, stomped into the church and harangued our receptionist. You do not want to be the receptionist at Old South Church in Boston. <laughs> We're open seven days a week for the public, and the receptionist hears everything. So harangued our receptionist, charging us, in so many words, with heresy and sacrilege for having dared to add to Holy Writ our own editorial flourish. For our part, we felt the banner was provocative and probative and parabolic perhaps even prophetic, an occasion to engage the moral imaginations of passers-by in the way that we feel Jesus often did. And you get to decide for yourselves. Mm -hmm. Part three, Jesus as Muse. It was in the 10th century or so the story goes that Prince Vladimir of Kiev decided that his nation needed a religion. To that end, the prince sent out his ambassadors to investigate the religious landscape of the time. And he instructed these ambassadors to return with recommendations as to which religion was the best religion. We should all do this, right? He sent some of his ambassadors to the Muslims, some to the Byzantines, some to the Catholics, and others to the Jews. And upon their return, the ambassadors reported their findings to the prince. It was the ambassadors who visited the Basilica of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople who returned with the most fabulous story. They reported that then, when they were within the basilica, it was so splendidly beautiful, they did not know if they were in heaven or on earth. And upon hearing this report, Prince Vladimir concluded that God surely dwells with the Orthodox, since God and beauty are one. The prince chose the Byzantine faith of Orthodox Christianity, and he imported it to his country hoping thereby to bring harmony to a country in turmoil. For fun, this is sort of the, the third Sunday in Lent moment in this lecture, uh, you might turn at the back of your sheet, at the, take a look at their cartoon. I'm guessing that's how Prince Vladimir felt after adopting the Byzantine faith of Orthodox Christianity. And it's also how I feel about my adopted tradition. It's how my Muslim friends feel about Islam, and my Jewish friends feel about Judaism. I hope it's also how you feel about your tradition. I further hope the New Yorker cartoon makes you smile and nod, causing you to laugh a little bit at yourself as it makes me laugh at myself. For these religions to which we cling and over which we sometimes argue 
are in the end mere conveyances, somewhat faulty vehicles, for surely there is more than one way, way to reach our very big God. Back to Jesus as muse. With the ears of your memory, summon the stirring music of Handel's Messiah, or conjure, if you will, the strains of African-American spirituals. There is a balm in Gilead, deep river, down by the riverside. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Steal away to Jesus. Such songs and tunes wrung from utter desperation were born of the hope Jesus provides. Or with your mind's eye, summon an image of Michelangelo's Pieta. None who has ever walked the earth has inspired more art and more sublime art than Jesus of Nazareth, a Galilean peasant. He is our greatest muse. What is it about Jesus that has inspired some of the finest art the world has known? Well, Christians claim that in Jesus we can actually see and discern something of the very beauty of God. That in and through Jesus we glimpse the beauty of holiness, the grandeur of profound serenity, the loveliness of truth, the bonds of love, the magnificence of mercy, the liberation of forgiveness, the excellence of humility, the enchantments of generosity. In Jesus, God sends us a muse so powerful and so evocative, he has inspired men and women across the centuries to pour themselves out, authoring beauty in art and music and literature, but also in stunning acts of courage and kindness. For the beauty Jesus inspires is more than skin or canvas deep. In those who fall under his spell, Jesus inspires a beauty that is soul deep, the kind of soul deep, self-emptying beauty of St. Francis of Assisi responding to Christ's call to a life of poverty. Or the soul deep majesty not only of Dr. King's dream of justice, but his willingness to die for it or the tender grandeur of Archbishop Oscar Romero's passion for the poor of San Salvador. In 2006, we were stunned to learn of a murderous rampage visited upon an Amish community in rural Pennsylvania. A gunman entered the community's one-room schoolhouse and there, execution style, in pitiless cold blood, he gunned down students, children. Five children were murdered that day, six more wounded, one of whom remains permanently disabled. The horror of the murders was widely reported. But what reverberated around the world, what captured our attention because of its sublime and astonishing beauty, was the Amish community's corporate act of forgiveness. They defied the ways of an avenging world. They refused to meet violence with violence, even more magnificently, they refused to meet hatred with hatred or coldness with coldness. Moreover, it was they, these grief-stricken parents, this aching community, who comforted the wife and children of the gunman. The Amish are a people apprenticed to Jesus, tutored in the life of Christ. Onto a canvas stained with blood and anguish, the Amish painted with sure and deft strokes the colors of God's deepest beauty, the living colors of perhaps the most difficult of Christian arts, the high art of forgiveness. The Christian community is a community of artists. Under the spell of Christ, tutored by his high spiritual art, we sculpt and mold ourselves into God's works of art. It is Christ who is our muse and inspiration, the mystical genius who awakens our spiritual creativity. Jesus as Muse, a pastoral application. Quite a few years ago, Old South Church in Boston started offering ashes to go out of doors on Ash Wednesday. This was to be in addition, not in replacing, but in addition to our Ash Wednesday services held inside in the sanctuary and chapel. Old South Church is located in Boston's Copley Square at a bustling urban intersection. Foot traffic and traffic traffic are plentiful. <laughs> Ashes to go would be offered out of doors to passers-by. We set up stations outside on our Italianate piazza. 
The stations were staffed throughout the day, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. by clergy in clerical garb. Most clergy took one or two hour shifts. We are a teaching church. There's always plenty of seminarians to do that sort of thing. I assure you we discussed this outdoor ritual at some length before committing to it. Was this a sort of cheap grace we were offering? Did it represent a knockoff fast food version of Christianity? We studied the Gospels and came to the conclusion it's actually the sort of thing Jesus did. In his parable of the sower, Jesus is at pains to tell of scattering the seed, the good news of the Gospel, rather carelessly, imprecisely and generously, even prodigally leaving the fate of the scattered seed to others. And that's how we came to view Ashes to Go. And what transpired was a little like the movie field of dreams and the axiom, if you build it, they will come. We built our little stations, and oh, did they come. From 8 a.m. till 8 p.m., a steady stream of passers-by availed themselves of the ashes and blessings we had on offer. Seeing us, cars came to screeching halts, double park right there on Boylston Street. <laughs> their drivers put their emergency lights to flash and they jogged over to us. What is your name? I'd ask. Jose, he said. And I, dipping my thumb into the ashes, raising it to Jose's forehead, looking him in the eyes and tone, remember, Jose, that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. But for today, Jose, you live. Go then, go with God's peace. On and on they came, mothers with strollers, teenagers on their way to school, workers on their lunch breaks, tourists who'd forgotten their travels had taken them away from home on a Christian holy day, whole fire trucks disgorged their firefighters <laughs> for ashes. They kept coming and coming all day long and into the evening. And it's possible some of you think of this as a theological deviation and ecclesiastical negligence or worse, and I suppose I wouldn't blame you because in the abstract, it doesn't quite work for me. But if you had been there, if it was you looking into all those eyes, touching all those warm brows, invoking the ancient words of the psalmist, imposing ashes out of doors in public on the street, if you had been there, seen it, and experienced it, I think you might feel differently about it. Artists use the phrase on plain air to describe the act of painting outside away from the confining four walls of the studio. To paint on plain air is to experience painting or drawing in the landscape. Ashes to go is on plain air ministry. And the truth is that's the way Jesus did it. Most of his ministry, nearly all of it, was conducted out of doors in full public view on plain air. Postscript. We minister today in a difficult context. Christian nationalism simmering beneath the surface throughout much of our nation's history is coming to a boil and spilling out. It is a rabid, distorted, un-Jesus-like version of Christianity, and it is loose upon the world. Conversely, researchers tell us that if we were to go outside to Boston today, you and I, and just find passers-by and interview them, asking them, when you think of the Christian church, what comes to mind? They will tell you that in their minds, the Christian church is boring at best and judgmental at worst. That the Christian church is homophobic, arthritic, and hypocritical. Add to this the fact that religion is all over the news every day, and it's become very much of a political football. And the media tends to report about religion's worst and most outrageous behaviors, not about any of the good it does, and on the outrage front, there is, sadly, much to report. In the light of such realities, you might judge that this little lecture on Jesus utterly fails to present a Christianity sufficient to facing down the atrocities of our, do of our day. I would argue that Christianity has operated at its best, has risen to its finest version of itself, when it has operated from the margins, quietly yet firmly offering a different course, serving as a leavening agent, not competing with culture, just quietly going about our business, miming Jesus, 
holding a mirror to ourselves, authoring acts of beauty in God's name. This is what we have to offer. It may not be enough to save the world or save democracy or rescue all the suffering, but it is enough to give witness to the hope that is in us. Maybe in the end, that is what God asks of us. In the face of a hard-hearted world, we are called to parry with compassion, mercy, and kindness. To a greedy world, we can offer generosity, meeting cold fists, closed fists with open hands. In a world of privileges and pedigrees, it is our delight to parry with the astonishing, astonishing assertion that in Christ there is neither slave nor free, male nor female, Jew nor Gentile, which in the language of its day pretty well covered most of the isms and divisions the early church could imagine. To a world dependent on violence, addicted to violence, we counter with the Prince of Peace, with Christ's own deep peace, a peace the world cannot and will not give. To the world's strong men, and they will always be with us, we answer with a peasant from Galilee whose life changed the course of history and over whom the rulers of the earth have no power. And for all the world's injustices, for all the suffering, the injury and anguish experienced here on earth by uncounted multitudes, refugees, children of war, hungry, the despised, the cold, the sick, the prisoner, the oppressed, we bear witness to the hope of heaven. For we dare to believe that this world is not the best nor the last, that the best is yet to come, and that those who suffer now will have their reward. Closing. This lecture is an invitation to the church to wonder aloud about how to be less churchy and more Jesus-y, more Jesus-y and less doctrinal, more ready to surprise the world by extending mercy. It is a plea to do as Jesus did, meet people where they are on plain air with all the considerable grace and mercy, joy and beauty at our disposal. As the church, we have within our possession the balm of Gilead, the means of grace, the promise of salvation, the power of forgiveness. We have the story of Jesus, the greatest story ever told. Let's not hoard it or guard it overly much. Let's not bury it or Jesus under strata of ecclesiastical doings. The story of Jesus is to be given freely and generously, as freely and as generously as Jesus bestowed blessings as liberally and indiscriminately as he fed the 5,000, as arbitrarily as his sower scattered seed. Before the Mormon Tabernacle Choir or African-American spirituals, before Christmas trees or Easter eggs, before electronic organs or Sunday school, before infant or believer's baptism, before the apostles or Nicene creeds, before Jesuits or Boston College, before Old South Church, before Christianity. God entered this world clothed in warm human flesh, walked among us, and made our heads turn. In the person of Jesus, God captures our attentions and our moral imaginations, commissioning the church in Christ's name to this most prophetic charge. Go and do likewise. Thank you. Are we willing to take questions? From yes. Us? Let me start. Um, I was dean of this school for six years. I am no longer dean here. I am across the street in theology. But you're on a Yale Divinity School faculty, or the board. And I know you had a whole succession of seminarians come to Old South Church. And when I was here, I was always asking, like, what can I say to people to come to study for the ministry? What, like, what, what are two or three things I can say to give them in an encapsulated form what they should be looking for and how they should conceive their ministry. What did you tell that? The succession of very talented seminarians whom I heard preach in Old South Church. I have an answer to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I Speaking to seminarians, um, I was on the board of Andover Newton before I was on the, the Yale board, um, and saying to young people thinking about ministry, I, I asked them to imagine 
the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, um, the, the creation of Adam. And you have God reaching down and Adam reaching up. And in those inches between God's finger and Adam's, that is where ministry, that is where clergy set up shop. That is our office, our laboratory. There between heaven and earth, spiritual and material, life and death, good and evil, time and eternity. It is the most exciting place to be. It's where everything matters. Everything is high stakes. Everything matters. Um, and that clergy have the enormous privilege of operating in that space between Adam's finger and God's. Val and our very talented senior has a, a mic, so I think there's a question over here, Val. Thanks so much, Nancy. This is absolutely fantastic. I'm really struck by the examples that you give are all ones that force us to kind of confront our humanity face to face. But we're living in a kind of post-COVID virtual world. And I'm wondering what you think, is this, is this a, a period of optimism for you? Does the virtual, especially as people seem to pull away from the face to face, offer opportunities? Or is it a larger challenge? I know that that Christ didn't <laughs> didn't have Zoom <laughs> that he had to deal with, but you know what, what do we do with that? You asked about am I optimistic about the church or about 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 the kind of does the digital age provide us affordances for the church and for doing this sort of work? You know, Mark invented a new genre in writing his gospel, and I, you know, the the way Christianity has been carried and taught and passed on person to person, mouth to mouth over the millennia has been different in different media. I think we're going to learn to exploit and use these medias in some good ways and they will always be exploited and used in terrible ways. Mm -hmm. I think it's just with us and we and we don't get to choose to be optimistic or pessimistic about it. <laughs> we do with it what we can and how we will. I think it has opportunities that are beautiful and amazing mm -hmm. and perils. So I don't know if that's your answer to your question. I'm not utterly an optimist, I think, about human nature, but I am about God. <laughs> Thank you for this wonderful um, lecture. So I was really struck by your um, integration of the silence of Jesus into the Jesus is mine section. And I'm curious about, like, so I think often in the Gospels, Jesus use or uses silence as a way to kind of disempower a cycle of violence. I'm thinking of like the woman who the crowd wanted to throw stones and Jesus was silent and wrote on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then also with Pontius Pilate, like the, the silence there kind of disempowers something that's trying to come at him in like a, a violent way. Um, so I'm wondering in your own, especially in your career of activism, how do we, or how do you discern the value of silence compared to the value of activism and like what do you how do you understand the relationship between those two thank you i, I mean I, I guess i think that jesus's um model of engagement and retreat engagement and retreat works pretty well mm -hmm. um he did you know that that was a rhythm he i think all of the gospels attest to that he's out there but then he's trying to to retreat and be you know have a little personal time, a little regather time. Um, you know, I guess it's always going to be a, a balancing act and, and a juggling act. And I would say, you know, a bunch of Old South Church in Boston is here and some people are more are more quiet people and, and, and you know, want to be praying for the others who are out there on the front lines and so they're both are, are welcome as well. I don't think there's necessarily one absolute way of doing it. Um, the one phrase that struck me the deepest was, be more Jesus-y. <laughs> and I know that that rang true for other people because you got quite a reaction when you said that. So I'm a theology student here, um, and I'm old. 
and I noticed that. Not so old. <laughs> a lot of us are older than you are, but. I noticed that there are older people in this room. How do um, those of us who believe deeply and, um, and have, have been faithful for a long time act Jesus-y toward young people who just seem to have so much doubt and so much, I guess that's the word, doubt. I mean, I think we have to just give bear witness to the hope that is in us mm -hmm. and ho hope that they see in the way we live our lives something that's maybe worth emulating. You know, young people have to go through stages and phases too, um, and maybe some of it is just being um, patient and generous about that. They're, the world looks pretty terrible to them. Um, my guess is they haven't read as much history as I have to know that it's been terrible all the time. <laughs> right? um, you know, it's been pretty bad throughout human history. I, the people who say that, you know, this country's never been in worse shape, I, I, that's just patently not true. Only privileged white people can say that, actually. Um, I think that the struggle between good and evil has been with us from the beginning and will continue to be with us. Um, you know, I, I think the other thing I would say is, you know, I, I don't blame their pessimism and their doubtfulness. I'm, I'm Kierkegaardian in the sense of Kierkegaard talks about taking a leap to faith, that, you know, I mean, I've just made a decision. I stand in a place of believing. That's an intellectual decision I've made. I can't prove any of this stuff to you, right? Um, you know, I could die and like nothing happens, or I can die and go, oh shoot, I got that all wrong. I should have been Muslim, you know? Um, but I, I, I choose to live inside what I think of as the beautiful story of Jesus and operate from within that story because it's the best story I know for me in my, in my, in my life. Well, thank you all for bearing with me for 40 minutes or however long it took. And it's good to see you all. And um, thank you, Nancy. <laughs>